But if, doesn't that church look great? A beautiful song, beautiful people, beautiful voice. I'm going to run on the But then I want to thank all the faithful people that sacrificed their time to make the church look the way it is. It takes a lot of time and sacrifice, and we're really grateful for each and every one. And the Lord notices everything, and we're really grateful and appreciative to everybody. One body, many parts. We all need each other to let this happen, for sure. All right. We've got a lot of ground to cover this morning, as it is the first week of Advent and also the Lord's Supper. So I want us to turn to Romans chapter 3. Just hold your finger there just so we can get started here. We will be going to Romans chapter 3. As always, the Holy Spirit will be taken over as I go into these scriptures. So prepare your minds and your hearts to receive the message the Spirit is trying to say to the church this morning. Amen? Because the devil's always going to try to cause a distraction in your head. Try to stay focused. All right. The Lord's Supper is a wonderful gift from God. And a seal of God's promises to all who have come to Christ in repentance and in faith. The more we grasp the meaning and significance of the Lord's Supper, the more we will benefit from it. Here are some ways we can enter more fully into the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, the bread and cup, remind us of Christ, the Son of God, suffered and died on the cross for our healing and forgiveness. Okay, the first principle. Believers are righteous by faith, okay? The Lord's Supper is a reminder of the grace of God. Partaking of the body and blood of Christ reminds us that by the grace of God, we are the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3, please, verse 22. The Bible tells us clearly, in verse 22 of Romans chapter 3, we are made right with God by being good boys and girls in church. Oh. That's not in there. See, our, our, our system of the world is always based on performance. But our, our, our relationship with Jesus has nothing to do with performance. It has everything to do with what we believe in in our faith. Can I get an amen here? It says, we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, or in the word of God. And this is true for everyone who believes. See, it's true for everyone. Nobody is excluded from this in the world. Everybody has a chance to come to Jesus. No matter who we are. Can I get a big amen there? There's a lot of religions say you have to be this and do that. There's certain people that can get in, certain people that can't. But the Bible tells us clearly that it's true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So we believe what the Bible says. Amen? For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standing. So when we hear this, we know that we're all in the same boat this morning. All right, we all fall short of God. No one's better than anybody else. And then it says in verse 24, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. And how did he do it? He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Amen. We are no longer, the penalty of our sins has been erased. The moment we believe in Jesus, the penalty of our sins is gone. How about a big amen there? And that can't be retracted. It's a, gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so no one can boast about it, right? For we're God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the things, the good things that he planned for us long ago. What does he mean? Well, our sin nature stops us from doing God's work, and it makes us do our work instead of God's work. Can I get an amen here? Once we get rid of our sin nature, now we can begin to do God's work in the spirit. Amen? Okay, now, the other principle, believers have a new status, okay? Partaking of the Lord's Supper reminds us of our new status as God's beloved children. It reminds us of God's grace that made it possible for the Son of God to become, became the Son of Man, that sons of men may become sons of God. Thank you, Jesus. It was the grace of God that allowed Jesus to be forsaken and rejected so that we might be accepted as God's beloved children who can come to him and call him Abba, Father. Amen? 
Thank you, Jesus. He tore the curtain, tore the veil. We go directly into the presence of God. We don't have to go to any more mediators anymore. Amen? Right to Jesus. Believers, are under, uh, believers, we live under a new covenant now, okay? Partaking of the Lord's Supper reminds us that we are partakers of all the provisions of the new covenant. Unlike the old, it does not depend on what we do, but on what God has already done for us. It is not of works, but of grace. We no longer forgive to be forgiven, but we forgive because we have been forgiven. How about a big amen there? Okay. We no longer give to receive, but we give because we have been given so much. Our actions are now motivated by Christ living in us. The Bible has come to us in the form of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? The old covenant between God and Israel was dedicated with the blood of sacrificed animals. As a result of this covenant, God delivered Israel from bondage. On Mount Sinai, God gave them the law as part of that covenant. The covenant bound God to his word and Israel to the terms of the covenant. The New Testament is a new covenant enacted and sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper while he and his disciples were celebrating the Passover meal. The Passover was a type of shadow of the Lord's Supper and also of the crucifixion and death of Christ. The Passover meal commemorated Israel's deliverance from bondage in Egypt. The Lamb's blood smeared on the doorpost of their homes was for their redemption as it signified that the coming judgment had already been carried out on the sacrificed lambs. Are we hearing me so far this morning, church? The Israelites, I'm trying to educate you here on the whole covenant here. The Israelites also had to eat every part of the roast lamb before they started their journey into freedom for healing and strength, and there was not one feeble person among them. The institution of the communion was to remind them of a greater deliverance, the deliverance from slavery to sin and Satan. As the blood of the lamb saved the Israelites, so the blood of Christ saves us. In the communion, we are partaking of the new covenant. The cup signifies the blood of Christ shed for our redemption, and the bread typifies his body to be eaten for our healing and strength. Turn with me to John chapter 6, please. Like I said, the more we understand why we do this, the more of a benefit it will be in our spiritual life. Amen? So that's why we have to understand what, what this all represents and what it actually does for us. Instead of just making an empty ritual. John chapter 6, go with me to verse 47, please. Wow, you guys are getting there quicker and quicker every week. Amen. That's the whole goal. You're getting there. John chapter 6, verse 47. I tell you the truth. Right, I'm give everybody a second to get there. Yeah, the page is still moving. That's all right. We've got a lot of room. We need a lot of room to grow. We need a lot of grace, and that's what we have here. That's what the grace is for. Okay, it gives us a lot of time and a lot of room to grow. And all of us need that. I tell you the truth, verse 47. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. As a matter of fact, our TV show that we have now is called The Bread of Life. And we're reaching, uh, I actually got a comment that somebody saw it, that one of my neighbors actually watched it. And actually, he's going to keep watching it. So they can't be here. So, amen. It's reaching. It's getting to people. Amen. That's what it's for. Now it says in verse 49, Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. 
Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. Verse 52. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, he wasn't talking literally. He was talking spiritually there, but they weren't spiritual yet. Amen? They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They didn't know what they were taking it literally. How are we going to eat them? We're not cannibals. And then the people began arguing, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate manna, but will live forever. How about an amen? So what is it saying here? Now we take the cup and we eat the bread as a reminder, and we really take in and internalize what Jesus really did for us. It's a tangible way to see if something that happened to us spiritually, amen? So we actually see that we're taking in the word of God. That's what he says, eats my flesh, which is Jesus is the word of God. As we take this in and internalize it, it becomes part of who we are. Now that takes time for it to get in here to come out of here. See, it gets into our mind. We start pushing the world system out of our minds and then Jesus' life starts coming into our heart and we start what? Acting in a way that pleases God and not ourselves anymore. Amen? And that takes time, and we need a lot of room, a lot of grace, and a lot of mercy. Can I get an amen here? But he never what? Leaves us or forsakes us, and he said that he would do it, that he would give us the power to do it if we choose. Amen? It's always a choice. Now, it's a reminder to always give thanks for what he did now. For the fellowship of believers, the Lord's Supper is a reminder to rejoice. And give thanks for being part of a fellowship of believers. Okay? What better place can we find than at the communion table where we fellowship with our fellow brothers and sisters in the presence of God in his house, the church. Amen? And it's for the unity of believers. This unifies us. See, as we all take this in, it makes us all one part of one body. And we all accept each other just the way we are. See, at the Holy Communion, all believers are united into one body as they partake of the body and the blood of Christ. In the early church, a large piece of unleavened bread was passed through the congregation. Each believer broke off a piece for himself. All right, the smaller portion indicating that Christ died for each individual, and the larger portion that they all shared a common salvation made up of one body. What better place to give thanks than where we celebrate our unity? as our one body in our church. Amen? That's why we take we don't take it lightly here. Without the body and blood of Christ, we would not have a church. Amen? So that's why we always got to what? Remind us of that. And as for the abundant blessings of God, we have to thank Him about the blessings that we get every day. All of us got up this morning. All of us was able to get dressed and see, have a warm shower, live in a country where we're free to worship without any tyranny. That is a blessing. See, we take for granting the blessings that God gives us. There's people right now that can't mention Jesus Christ. There's people right now that can't gather in a church and talk about Jesus. There's people right now that can't have a Bible. There's people right now that can't have a church or a preacher. Or else they get executed. Right now, we're getting a message beyond the four walls going all over the world. Somebody's going to find salvation this morning. And we're all part of the same body to do that, amen? It's not just about us. It's about him and how we represent him properly in the way ministries. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, before he gave the disciples the bread and wine, he gave thanks to God, always before he ate it. We who receive what God has blessed are blessed, and our only response can be to thanksgiving for his abundance and blessings. Do we do it because we have to? No, we do it because we want to, because what he's done for us. 
The Lord's Supper reaffirms our unity as one body in our fellowship with one another in a way that no other group can ever experience. We cannot partake of it in hate or speak evil of a brother and sister. Can I get an amen here? Our Lord has said he is present at every communion, and we must therefore be careful to make it a meaningful experience. The bread and wine should be consumed with sincere appreciation, thanksgiving and gratitude, believing that his body was broken for our healing and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sin. The communion is a family meal, and the Lord of the family desires that his children are healthy, thankful, and love and care for one another. At the Lord's table, we celebrate the living Christ in our hearts, in lives, and share in his divine nature. At the Lord's table, we enter into intimate fellowship with God and with our fellow brothers and sisters. At the Lord's table, we demonstrate our unity and our mutual loyalty and love for Jesus Christ. The Holy Communion declares our oneness with Christ, as Christ is also we are as in this world. 1 John 4, 17. Let us enjoy God's abundant blessings as we partake of the communion so that we can make a difference in the world to the praise and glory of Almighty God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One day, we will come to the Lord's Supper for the last time. When Christ calls you home, your faith will be turned to sight as we are translated from the worship of earth to the worship of heaven. Until that day, we look back, we look in, we look up, and we look around and look forward. Draw strength from your Savior as you partake of the bread and of the cup. Who was invited to the wedding feast this morning? Who is to receive the Lord's Supper? All who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who died on the cross, that they may be forgiven and reconciled to God and rose from the dead. How about a big amen there? All right, let's pray. Lord, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us sustenance to run the race before us. As we break the bread, we feel the softness of your love for us. We smell the fragrance of the grace you release afresh each day. We thank you with all our hearts for the great price you paid when you were crucified on the cross for us. Yet just as the yeast has caused the bread to rise, you rose again, triumphant over death, as Lord of Lords and King of Kings forever. And our beloved Savior, Lord, as we drink this cup, we remember that you are the giver of life. You are forgiveness. You bring deep peace to our souls, and, you lo and your love flows within us, Lord. As we pour out this cup, we see your sacrifice poured out for us. We notice the depth of your goodness and the pain you suffered for us. We dwell upon the intricacy of human life and the price you paid to set humanity free. Yet just as the tombstone rolled away to unleash the risen Lord, your light shines in our hearts this morning, now extinguishing all darkness to release heaven's blessing upon us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, we take communion to remember the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He broke the bread, he gave thanks, we remember communion, and the events that lead to Jesus' crucifixion, death, and resurrection. At this time, I'm going to call the ushers up to pass out the elements.
Thank you, guys. All right, if you want to follow along with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the Lord's broken body, let us eat the bread. Not bad. Okay, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are renouncing the Lord's death until he comes again. In remembrance of the Lord's death and shed blood on the cross, let us drink the cup. Goes pretty good together, huh? All right. All right, let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, Jesus, we praise you for this heavenly banquet that you have so freely given us. Thank you that we carry in our hearts the riches of this eternal goodness, Lord. May we pour it out wherever we go, lighting up the darkness with truth, speaking out hope where there is despair, and weaving your unconditional love into all we do. Send us now in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. May we live to be all that you have destined us to be. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, thanks and praise to you. Again, you fed us at your holy table with your own body and blood. By your word and supper, may we be led from this world of sorrow into life eternal. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, how about a round of applause for our work? Thank you, Jesus. All glory and honor goes to him. All right, just getting warmed up now. <laughs> now we've got another important message about in our Advent season as we've got the candle lit of hope. Jesus is the hope of the world. Right now, People are losing hope out there, left and right. The world's getting really, really dark as they're taking the word of God out of society. And people are doing what's right in their own sight. And it's causing a lot of havoc and reaping a lot of trouble in America. Can I get any men here? All right, so let's talk about Advent a little bit here. And I understand what we're really doing here. Instead of just celebrating Christmas on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, we can celebrate it for the whole month. Amen? This is an awesome time right now. While Advent is certainly a time of celebration and anticipation of Christ's birth, it is more than that. It is only in the shadow of Advent that the miracle of Christmas can be fully understood and appreciated. And it is only in the light of Christmas that the Christian life makes any sense. It is between the fulfilled promise of Christ's first coming and the yet-to-be-fulfilled promise of his second coming. Unfulfilled and fulfilled promises are related to each other as are dawn and sunrise. Both promise and, in fact, the same promise. If anywhere at all, then it is precisely in the light of the coming of Christ that faith has become Advent faith. Okay, the expectation of future revelations. But faith knows for whom and what it is waiting for. It is fulfilled faith because it lays hold on the fulfilled promise. The promise for Israel and the church is Jesus Christ the Lord has come to earth and will arrive again. This is the essence of Advent. During Advent and Christmas, festively decorated evergreen wreaths hang in windows and on doors everywhere. In many homes and churches, it is also common to see special wreaths lying on tables 
or ledges adorned with four candles, usually three purple and one pink. Oh, we got that. Three purple and one pink. Yeah. This familiar symbol of the season is the Advent wreath. Let's get an understanding of this. Traditionally, the Advent wreath is a circle of evergreen branches. It is often decorated with berries and pine cones. Cool. Both the evergreen branches and the circular shape symbolize the passing of time and eternal life. The shape of the wreath with no beginning or end reflects the complete and endless love that Jesus has for us. During the Advent season, we eagerly anticipate his first and second coming and the promise of eternal life in heaven with him. The first Sunday of Advent in 2023 will be Sunday, December 3rd. Yeah, that's today. After a tumultuous year, there is comfort to be found when we pause to read, to pray, and to reflect over the course of the Advent season in which believers eagerly anticipate the celebration of Jesus Christ's birth. The most common Advent candle tradition, however, involves four candles. A new candle is lit on each of the four Sundays before Christmas. Each candle represents something different. Although traditions vary, the four candles traditionally represent hope, love, faith, joy, and peace. Often, the first, second, third, and fourth, a fifth white candle is placed in the middle and is lit on Christmas Day to celebrate Jesus' birth. See it? See, now we understand why that's all there, right? I'm making this understandable for us. Why we're doing this. The first Sunday of Advent gives us the opportunity to center our thoughts on hope. It's a beautiful chance to remember the hope God offers to our lost and dying world and that he's given us and the hope that he's given us through Jesus Christ. Go with me to Galatians chapter 4, please. We don't just have an empty ritual here. We have the meaning and purpose of it, why we do it. So it's a reminder of what's going on in the hope of all the world. Galatians 4, verse 4, please. Give me a second to get there. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. All right, verse 4. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. What's he saying there? Right at the right time in your life, when you accepted Jesus Christ, God knew exactly what, when you would do it. Exactly the time that pleased him. You know what he said? I wish I found this earlier. You would have never accepted it any other time than when God placed it into your hearts. Can I get an amen here? When the exact right time came, he sent his son into our hearts. Born of a woman. Now look at verse 5. God sent him. Why did God send Jesus into the world? To buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children or sons. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Amen? That's a personal thing. Abba. Papa. Abba is an Aramaic term for father. Now, look what it says in verse 7. You are no longer a slave, but God's own child. What's he saying? You're no longer a slave to sin, but now you're the what? God's child. Free and clear of all sin. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. What's his heir? We're guaranteed. Heaven is our home, guaranteed. Paul, right? And it says, before you Gentiles knew God, 
You were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. What's he talking about? He's talking about we were slaves to things that we thought were gods, like our possessions and things that kept us safe in the world, our homes, our kids, our families. We thought that those were gods. That's what kept us going. And then we found what? The real God. He's the only one. God's the one who created all that. We were worshiping the things that he created over the creator himself. Can I get an amen? But when the right time came, God sent his son into the world so we could what? Receive him and start to worship what? The creator over the created. And then when we do that, everything that he created for us falls into place properly. And it's good. God saw that it was very, very good. How about an amen? Okay, so we understand that. Paul, okay, now listen up. Paul was the writer of Galatians, articulates so perfectly the great hope we have at Christmas. Without God's intervention, we were all slaves, bound up by our sin nature, and hopelessly headed to the grave. Right? Because of God's great love for us, he came down and rescued humanity by sending his son as a sacrifice for our sin. So we could be free from the chains of sin and become fully part of God's glorious, eternal family. How about a big amen there? We're no longer slaves to sin. We're now slaves to righteousness. Now, do we still sin? Absolutely. We're, this sinful body can't inherit the kingdom. But now the war goes on, right? We want to do right. We find ourselves doing wrong. The Paul said in Romans 7, it's sin living in, the me, in me that does it. It's like a virus. It comes out at any given time, right? And the devil uses people, places, and things to bring our sin nature out. And a lot of times, we get mad at people, places, and things, and what? We blame them instead of just saying, you know, that's just the devil. I'm going to pray for the people and pray for the people and the places and the things. And the God's just opening up the pressure cooker to show us what, how much we need to save them. No matter how many times we come to church, no how many times we pray, no how many times we read the Bible, our sin nature still shows its ugly head at times, whether we like it or not. Can I get an amen here? And that's what his grace and mercy is for, for us to what? Say no to it, to get sick of it, and say yes to him. Say, you know what, I'm not going to I'm not gonna talk about that person anymore. They're just going through something. I'm going to pray for them. I'm not going to gossip and slander about them. I'm going to pray for them. Because I wouldn't want anybody to gossip and slander about me. So the Bible, the essence of the Bible is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if you want anybody to talk about you and gossip about you, don't you slander and gossip about anybody. Amen? Or else it'll come back on you. When, when we, when we, when we um, tear up somebody and gossip about somebody, we're only tearing ourselves up. Because we do the very same things the Bible says. Thought, word, and deed. Can I get an amen here? All right, go to Romans chapter 6 now. That's what Jesus was saying. He said, we're slaves to sin. Why do we keep doing that? When we know that it's not right to do, we keep doing it anyway. Paul says, it's not me. It's sin living in me. It does. He says, it's like, it's, it's in me. It's ugliness inside of me. See, but before we got saved, we didn't fight with it. We just did it. Now that we're children of God, we what? We feel the shame and the guilt of our sin nature. We said, boy, that's ugly. Why can't I stop doing that? Lord, please help me to stop doing that. Because I don't like it anymore, Lord. I used to like it, but now I hate it. Something changed inside of me. Now I love the Lord with all my heart. But there's another power within me that's warring against that. Paul said, it's sin living in me that does it. Everybody gets the principle, right? We can't sit here in church and say we don't do that. We still fight against our sin nature every day, right? Amen, right? We don't come here all pious and say, oh, I did perfect today. None of us are perfect. We're maturing. We'll be getting perfected by thank God for his grace and mercy that it erases all that ugliness. But there's still ugliness in us that has to get rid of it. It's ugly. But thank God he loves us unconditionally. So when you come to church in the spirit, you don't have to talk about anybody. We talk about Jesus and what he did for us. We're all on the same page when we come to church in the spirit. All right, look at Romans 6, verse 1. We're going to really explain this this morning. Is everybody with me so far? 
But what's the explanation of it? Everybody thinks the Bible is complicated. It's very simple. And if you, if you keep an open mind and be like this down to earth, you'll understand everything it says. Look what it says in verse 1. Here's the human nature. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? <laughs> that's awesome, right? But that, that's us, right? Well, Lord, you know, I just want to keep sinning so we can glorify you. And it says in verse 2, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Now listen, living in sin is one thing, okay? Falling into sin is another one, okay? We have sins of weaknesses, like somebody cut you off on the road. Well, well I'm going to use that for me. My sin nature comes out. But is it always? No, I'm not living that way. I don't want that anymore. You understand? There's two things. If you're living in sin, knowing that it's wrong, and doing it anyway, that's living in sin. That is living in sin and rebellion against God. That's when the chasing and hand of God comes out. But when you have a sin of weakness, like, you know, you got into an argument with your wife because, you know, you didn't put your shoes away. That's all. And then things come out and say, oh, all right. And so what God, God, you know, that's not something that we do all the time. It's just something, sin of weakness. Get what I'm trying to say? Can I get an amen here? We have to understand living in sin and falling into sin are two different things. Now it says, since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? It's saying, as a born-again believer, your convictions will not let you stay living in sin. Can I get an amen here? Even though we know that we fall into sin, we can't stay there because our, our convictions stop us. Turn around. Come back. Repent. Come back to the Lord. You get the principle here? Now we're born again. Before we just stayed in it. Now he's saying, or have you forgotten? Or you have you forgotten when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism? We joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live, what does it say? A new life. New life. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Now it says in verse 6, now it says that we know. So you have to understand and know this. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. Why? So that sin might lose its what? Its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. What it's saying, we understand how powerful our sin nature is. So it says right now, it says, we know that it was crucified so it might lose its power. So in other words, it still has power. But it's telling us it's starting to lose its power. See, as we become, as we start to grow spiritually, our sin nature starts losing its power. And what? God's power starts to show up, and we start saying no to that stuff. Can I get any men here? It's not hard to understand this principle. Okay? And But do we still fall into it? Yes. But the thing of it is, we don't want that anymore. But it's so ingrained in us that it's a natural response to something that happens to us. If somebody hurts us, or somebody does something, or somebody says no to us when we want, when we want, when we want it, can I get an amen? We have to understand that we're still fighting against this. I fight against me all the time. It's almost like I don't know. Back in the day, they had these things called like, rock 'em sock 'em robots, and bashing each other until the thing would come up. And that's why I'm bashing me, me and my sin nature are fighting every day. For me to what? But I can win every day with Jesus. Amen. I can't win in the flesh. But it's a fight. If you're not fighting your sin nature, you're having a heart condition right now. See, you're, when you have the heart of God in you, you're always fighting against your sin nature. It shows up and says, oh man, I wish I didn't do that. But when you still want to do it, you're having a heart condition. You're growing cold to the things of God. Now it says, look at this says. Verse 7. Of verse 6, we know that our own sinful selves were crucified, so it might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. Now, look what it says in verse 9. We are sure of this, because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. 
in death no longer has any power over him. How about a big amen there? Are we getting the principle here? See, we start to understand our sin nature. Once you can understand it, you can actually do something about it and understand the power you have to fight against it. Look what it says in verse 10. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. What's he saying? You died to the power of sin, and now that you live, that you're born again, you live for the glory of God. See, this is what people don't understand. They still want to glorify glory for themselves. It says, no, you died to that life. Your new life is to glorify God now, not yourself. This world is dead to you now. You no longer want the things of the world. You want the things of God. That's the new nature. Can I get an amen here? All of us. But if you, still thought, if you still want the things of the world over the things of God, there's a heart problem there. You have to say, look, i got to repent. i got to get back to the Lord. I'm just playing church. The Bible tells me I have to die to that life. And my new life is with Jesus and serving him. And if I continue to live that way, I'm going to be a miserable Christian. How many miserable Christians in the house this morning? No, don't raise your hand because you know what I'm talking about. You're miserable because you're still serving yourself and wanting what you want. And when you don't get it, you're miserable. So you come to God like he's a grandpa. Oh, God, why is this happening to me? I'm supposed to be blessed every day. You are blessed every day. But not your way, his way. And you have to understand that. It's not going to go your way anymore. He owns you now. You don't, See, Christians don't understand. God owns you. You can do whatever you want. You can go back and live in sin if you want. But you are going to be one miserable Christian enlightened and living sinful. It's even worse than you were before. Until you accept the fact that God owns me now and I'm dying to that life and I have to start to live a new one. And until I do, I'm never going to enjoy it. Well, you could live all the way here and get spanked into heaven, whichever way you want to go. But when you're sealed, you're sealed. But who, do you want to really be miserable? Well, I thought everybody does. So Jesus would give us what? Joy, peace, patience, self-control. That's all only by what? Living for God. Living for yourself, you'll never get that. You can search the whole world for that. You'll never get that any other way until you say no to me and yes to him. How about an amen? And Jesus died so you can have that freedom. But do I have to? No. You should want to. All right, now listen. He's going to tell us again. Verse 9. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Now, he's going to talk about us. So you, believer, should also, you also should consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin. See it? And alive to God through Jesus Christ. Now it's saying in verse 12. Do not let sin control the way you live. So now it's saying. Is, can sin still control me? Yes. It's saying don't let it. So what does it mean by don't let it? That means I have to not let it win. I have to what? fight against my sin nature. It says don't let it. That means it's always going to try. The closer you get to the Lord, the more your sin nature tries to pull you back. Well, my, you're hearing me this morning. I'm being real with you here. This is a real church. It's telling us, do not let sin control you. If you are letting sin control you, it's because you do not believe that the power that God has given you is stronger than your sin nature. It's unbelief that keeps you living in it. It's unbelief that kept the nation Israel out of the promised land. It's unbelief from you getting in the promised land today, which is a state of mind. Joy, peace, patience, whatever's going on, you're good. You get it? That's the promised land. It's a state of mind now. And you can't get that any other way but by doing it God's way. So you can get rid of that song, I did it my way. That song doesn't, doesn't apply. 
Doing it your way gets you in the predicament that you're in. And continuing to do it your way will stay in your predicament because God gives us a free will. Your performance doesn't change that. Your faith does. And your belief does. And the power that you have over it does. He does for us what we can't do for ourselves. But he doesn't do for us what we can. Like say no. Can everybody say the word no in here? <laughs> All right. So when it comes to bringing its ugly head for you to do it, what do you have to do? No. Instead of saying, yeah, I like that sin. Because then look, if we didn't like sin, we wouldn't do it. Let's be honest. Sin is no longer your master. So going to tell us here. Now look what it says. Do not let sin, verse 12, control the way you live. Or don't let it reign in your body. Do not give in to sinful desires. What's it saying? Your, your body is still going to have sinful desires after you get saved. Do not let any of, listen what it says now. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Now, how am I going to get rid of that? It tells us how. I'm going to give you the way out. You want the way out of this? Here it is. Instead, give yourselves half-heartedly to God? No, it says completely to God. This is the thing that we're working on. This is what, what sanctification is. Starting to give ourselves completely to Him. Can I get an amen? Give yourself completely to God, for you were dead. But now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right to get a plaque on the wall. Oh, no, it doesn't say for that reason. It says for the glory of God. You see it? We get down here, we want, reward, we want a reward for doing good things down here. We want the plaque. So-and-so did this. But we do good because it's the right thing to do. There's, there's no reward for doing what we're supposed to do right. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. What are we going to get a plaque for? I want a plaque because I helped somebody cross the street this morning. I want people to see me. That's what the Pharisees were doing. Show me. Look at, look at me. Look at me. And then when they don't get recognized, they say, why? Nobody even noticed what I did. Jesus said, that's the only reward you'll ever get down here. When, don't let your left hand know what the right hand's doing. Your Father in heaven who sees everything will reward you. The less people see, the better. Get it? You don't want to be noticed. You want to stay what? Low profile. But Jesus is the one watching. Now look what it says. <laughs> Sin, look at verse 14 now. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law, which is the commandments. Look what it says. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's what? God's grace. You live under the freedom of grace. So what's the freedom of grace? The freedom of grace is the opportunity not to have a sin nature anymore. The grace of God stops us from sinning. Can I get an amen here? You live in its proper place. The grace of God is the most awesome thing in the believer's life. It's not a license to sin. It's the ability to stop. That's the power. Look at verse 15. Here comes the human heart again. Paul's, Paul is spot on with the human nature. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? That's it. And then he says, of course not. Be reasonable. Don't you realize that you become a slave of whatever you... You see it, you choose to obey it. You have to make a choice not to. It says what you choose to obey. Now you can be a slave to sin, listen to me now, which leads to death, spiritual death and physical death. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to what? Righteous living. Thank God, it says. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. So, the teaching you got today, if you wholeheartedly obey it, is when you're going to get blessed. And now it says, now you are free from your slavery to sin. You have become a slave to righteous living. How about a big amen there? So on this first Sunday of Advent, 
as we prepare our hearts to celebrate Jesus' arrival as a gift to all humanity, let's stir up in our hearts and homes a sense of anticipation. Over this Advent, we pray that hope would rise up in our spirits in a tangible, in a life-giving, life-changing way. How about an amen there? All right, the service is going to end now. I'm going to call the ushers to come up and take up the collections. Thank you for letting me share that. Remember, there's always hope with Jesus.